Hello, this is Bible Academy for Children. I'm Pastor Teacher Curtis Somo, and we continue in the book of Romans, chapter 16, the last chapter. Now, before we get started, as always, let's make sure that we have confessed our known sins. Hopefully, we shouldn't have many to confess. We should keep a short list at best and allow the Spirit of God to control us. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity and privilege, everything you've given us to study your word today. We ask now that we'll have open hearts and minds to your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Romans chapter 16, the last chapter in the book of Romans. Let's look at a little bit of an outline of it, just to give you an idea of where we're going. The first 16 verses, Paul gives a commendation and greetings. Then he talks about and warns of false teachers. Then he gives more greetings and closes with the doxology. A doxology is basically a few uh, verses, sometimes just two or three verses, of praise to God. So he finishes his letter with the praise to God. Today, we're going to look at the first 16 verses. Now, what's unusual about this letter is that, not that he gives greetings, but he gives it to so many people. Now, you know when we write letters today, usually our greetings is at the front. Dear John or dear Susan, whatever it may be, and then we sign it at the end. In those days, they did just the opposite. They would put their names at the beginning so you'd know who it was from. I think that's a pretty good idea. But we also have return envelopes where we can look at that too, so or return addresses. But anyway, they did just the opposite. So Paul puts a long list of greetings at this letter. Even though it's a long letter, this is still an extra long list. Then he tells them what they need to do. I'll tell you what that is. He says, greet one another with a holy kiss. We'll talk about that when we get there. The second unusual thing is that right after this, he breaks into a strong warning about false teachers. So, he starts out with this long list of greetings, okay? And then he has a warning. You can see that this must have been important for him to leave it as one of the last things. Then he comes back to more greetings. And then he closes out with what we call a doxology. That's a praise to God. All right? He begins in verse 1 praising a lady from a city that's not far from Corinth. Let's look at it. 16.1 I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who is a servant of the church, which is at Sincrea. Now, Phoebe is from another church. She's not from Corinth. Remember, Paul is writing this letter from Corinth. And she will be coming in their direction. That is, she'll be going to Rome. Many think she may be the one delivering the letter. And that makes a lot of sense because, first of all, he commends her in the letter. And he talks about her coming to Rome. All right? So, she appears to be the one who's going to take this letter on over to Rome. She's called a servant of the church. That means she may be in charge of something like food or clothing, uh, helping others who need have needs. She may be one who checks in on the sick, finds out why someone's not making it to the church. Uh, sh uh, sometimes servants would also watch over what money was collected for those who are poor, perhaps for the traveling minister, whoever's coming through. But anyway, Paul describes her as an active servant in that church. You know, we all should be active. As soon as we get old enough and learn our spiritual gifts, or even before we get that old, we can still help and serve 
and the church in some way. Well, we learned that she's from a city called Sincrea. Let's look at a map. Here's a map of what we call Paul's third missionary journey. Look over to the right, and I'm going to start this map. He started in this place called Antioch. I know this is kind of small, but it has to be that way to cover it. Stay with the blue lines. He traveled up by land, crossed the sea here, went on over and down to Corinth, which is where he is right now. He's in Corinth, writing this letter. Now let's enlarge our map, and we're going to see what appears right below Corinth. Looky there. There's our city, Sincrea. You see it? Right there. And notice it's right on the water. So they would call that a port city where ships would come in and unload their freight or pick up freight and go to the next town. You look across the way and there's Athens. Very famous Greek city, isn't it? Well, Phoebe was from Sincrea, and she is going to be sent from Corinth, probably the one who carries the letter over to Rome. Now let's shrink our map back down. And do you see Italy? There it is on the left. You can see the boot, not far away. Well, after Paul gets this letter on its way, he's going to return back to Jerusalem. Let's get our map back up. So let's start him on his way back. And on his way back he goes over some of the same land, Thessalonica, then he gets on the water. Goes back by the water. This is probably a lot quicker, especially if the winds are blowing right and he can get back to Jerusalem, on down to Jerusalem where he would deliver this contribution to the church. Okay? Well, now we have an idea of where Paul has to go and where he is and where Phoebe is from. Now, back in those days, people just, just did not just go somewhere and check into a motel or hotel. There wouldn't be that many. It probably cost more money than they, than they had. So, they would stay with friends or someone who knew someone and they would send along with that person a letter of recommendation saying that this person is safe this person is someone worth putting up and they help others and since we're brothers and sisters in Christ everyone knew that we should be open to this type of hospitality hospitality was an important thing in those days. So you'd have a Christian come in from let's say another city and they would stay with you. You could have some fellowship and meals and get to know each other and that's also important because one of these days you may go visit their town and you can see them again and that's a pretty good way to stay in contact with people. Now remember they just couldn't send emails instantly back in those days or even letters would take time. But Paul is going to recommend this lady to the church. And that's important. He says more about her <clears throat> in verse 2. Verse 2. That you receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints, and that you help her in whatever matter she may have need of you. For she herself has also been a helper of many and of myself. So she is known for helping other believers. She probably opened up her home when people down, uh, down Corinth Way came down to the port city of Centrea, Centrea. And she might let them stay with her. They'd have a meal, perhaps talk about things and get to know each other, discuss maybe the latest letters from Paul or some other apostle who had been passing, uh, who had been passing by, and and got these letters out. At any rate, she she even had helped Paul. Notice, 
at the end of the verse. For she herself has also been a helper of many and of myself. So, Phoebe's on her way to Rome, probably carrying this letter. Paul recommends her, and he opens up this last chapter, at least we call it a chapter. It would just be the closing of Paul's letter with that commendation about her. Now, Paul begins to continue all these greetings to a number of people, at least 26. Two of them are households, so that would mean they're slaves, perhaps the rest of their family. And there's at least three churches, maybe five. We'll say why maybe five as we come to them in our verses. Now, why would Paul give such a long greeting? Well, just think about it. He's never been to this church, all right? But he does know about a lot of the people there or know of them. So he lets all he can know that he's on his way. And they would read this church, probably in the assembly, perhaps, perhaps pass it around to the different house churches. <clears throat> so they would all get word. And the more knew that he was coming, the more they could perhaps prepare the support, tell others that Paul is one we really want to support, and they could perhaps start setting aside funds for when he gets there to help him help him on his trip on over to Spain. Remember, he wanted to go to Spain. That's a long ways off. Now, we're going to notice a lot of these names are Gentile names, the ones he gives the greetings to. This is basically what we've already learned, that most of the church was Gentile. Plus, we're going to see that there's a number of house churches. Now, what I mean by house churches... Well, let's say this is part of the long part of we know of Italy. And let's say this is Rome, okay? Big city, thousands and thousands of people. Well, that meant that they would be spread out pretty good, doesn't it? Let's put some roads in here, roads that come down from the north, roads that would cut over across, and there would be other roads, right, throughout the city. Well, within the city, they had what we call different house churches. So, we'd have a church over here. Okay, a church over here. A church over here. Maybe one over here. One down in here. So, where these Christians were, they would gather into this place, you see. Christians over here would gather to this one. Now, this doesn't mean that now and then they didn't all get together. It just probably depended on how far it was and the weather and so on. Maybe they all at one time gathered in one place. But you see, that was difficult because if there's more than, let's say, 50 or 60 people, they didn't have big auditoriums, not like we do today. They have some for performances and things that the uh, state took care of. But they would meet in people's homes. And less person had some... Uh, a large amount of money, you couldn't have probably more than maybe 20 people in there comfortably. So if they had somebody that had some money and had a larger house, they might host a bunch of bunch of these smaller churches. But usually they just stayed in churches. And that tells us a lot. That tells us that big churches are not that important. It also tells us that we as Christians need to be together. I don't care if it's two people or three or four or 20. We need to be together. And we need to support each other, pray for each other, help each other, talk to each other. We need each other after all. And this is really true. It is us against the world. The world and Satan's cosmos diabolicus. And we need to stay in contact with each other, you see. <clears throat> so these churches should also stay in contact with each other, whatever needed to be done. Okay? So, all of these smaller churches were called the Roman Church. We could call these house churches, just to make a difference or show the difference. 
But all these house churches made up the Roman church. And so when this letter got out, it probably passed around. Maybe two of these people worked at the same place, and they could pass it on to the next church that evening, you see. Well, there was good communication uh, among Christians as there needed to be to pass the word around. In verse 3, we meet our first Christian couple, a well-known Christian couple, Romans 16, 3. Paul says, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my co-workers in Christ Jesus. Now, some of your translations may say Prisca. It's the same person. It just depends on how people want to translate the Greek into English. This is a wife and uh, husband team. They were in Rome when Paul wrote this letter to the Roman Christians. Now, earlier, some years before, there was an emperor of Rome. He's one of the well-known emperors. His name was... Claudius. We can call him old Claude, but that's not very respectful of an emperor, so we'll just say Emperor Claudius, okay? So Claudius, at one time, ran all the Jews out of Rome. He, he didn't like the Jews there. Well, people thought that the Christians were just part of the Jewish group, so the Christians got ran out too, all right? And we learned that as Priscilla, I'm going to call him Priscilla, P and A, uh, P and A, they ran into Paul, met Paul, were actually ministering with Paul. They were also tent makers, just like Paul. We learned a lot of this in Acts 18, if you want to read through chapter 18. Uh, they ministered with Paul in Corinth, and then Paul would leave them. Well, eventually, Claudius died. And so Priscilla and Quilla go back to Rome. And that is where they are when Paul writes this letter. Claudius died in 54 AD, just to show you about what time this was. So it wasn't long after this that Priscilla and Quilla realized that it was safe to go back to where they probably did good business there in Rome, especially for travelers who needed tents or perhaps for the military. But anyway... They were tent makers, and they probably had a good business there. Now they wanted to go back and be able to support themselves well, perhaps missionaries and travelers and so on. Anyway, Paul is greeting them. He says some good things about them. He says not only are they co-workers, which he mentioned in verse 3, they work with him in ministry. And by the way, those of you who pray and support and and also keep in contact with me, you are a fellow co-worker. You help support not just the ministry, but me and my family, and I need that. I appreciate that, just as we pray for you. Now, there's many out there I've never seen, and that's okay. I'm not worth much worth looking at anyway, but let me tell you this. It's wonderful to know that there are other believers out there praying for me because I need your prayer. My family needs it. We have our problems and issues all the time. Uh, sometimes a couple come up a week that we have to deal with. Sometimes it's something that the boys are going through in, in their school or their work or I'm having to go through or some uh, health issue. Uh, that the kids go through, or my wife or myself. So we constantly need prayer. And of course, you know the devil's after us like he is all Christians who seriously want to follow Jesus. So we pray for each other. And we also work together when we do that. In verses 4 and 5, Paul talks more about Priscilla and Aquila. He says, who for my life risk their own necks, to whom not only I do give, do I do, <laughs> do I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. 
at some point they risked their lives for Paul. We're not told when. It may have been one of those riots. Maybe they helped Paul get away or they went and got the authorities. Or maybe they stood as witnesses or something else. But there was a something about this couple that Paul considered of great value. And that was part of it. And he also said, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. So in some ways, they were making a contribution to all the Gentile churches. I expect when they went around and people knew about their reputation, it may have been in business, that they were good, honest tent makers. Might have been rare in that day. I don't know. <clears throat> but they had made a contribution to the Gentile churches, at least through helping Paul, huh? Well, Paul recommends them, commends them, I should say, and tells the people back at Rome how much he appreciates them and how all the churches should appreciate them. One other thing about this couple, verse 5. <clears throat> also, greet the church in their house. So one of these house churches was in the house of Priscilla and Aquila. And that doesn't surprise me because they know, we know that they knew the word pretty well. There's other records of this, but they had helped Paul in ministry. They helped Apollos later on. You don't know him, but if you read Acts, you would learn about him. And they had this church in their house. So they would get together, learn the word of God, have some fellowship, bring the news of what was going on, perhaps about the church of Christ, and whatever else. I mean, you can see, imagine being in a town and suddenly being ordered to get out. Well, we've got our stories. Uh, we've been, actually, I was counting the times that we've been ousted from where we live. Sometimes it involved a church, sometimes it just involved the circumstances. Nothing done wrong, nothing illegal, but through circumstances uh, we had to leave. And that's not fun because suddenly you've got a large family, you have a short time to leave, and it's very hard to find affordable housing with my size of family in this area. But God has always provided and he always will. Don't forget that. Well, the second part of this verse, Paul brings in another person to greet. Greet Epinatus, my beloved, who is the first fruit from Asia in Christ. Now, this is the only time we run across the name Epinatus. Paul calls him beloved. Perhaps this means Paul knew him personally. He's called the first fruit, meaning he was the first believer or convert to Christianity from Asia. Now, you know what Asia was when they say this in Paul's letters. That actually refers to this area today to the right that sticks out. I can't get my map to flash, but it's the part on the right. This is Asia. This is, uh, I was going to see if I could light it up for you, but it is the area that we call modern, modern Turkey today. Here it is. I'm going to light it up. That's Asia. See it? A number of churches were there. So he was the first convert in Asia. And usually when they call him the first fruits, that indicates that's the first fruit of the harvest and there is more to come. That was Epinatus. In verse 6, we meet another person. Greet Mary who has worked hard for you. Now this isn't the famous Mary that was the mother of Jesus. Mary was a common name in those days. We have a lot of Marys still today in our day, uh, but it's not as common as it would have been back in Paul's day. It was especially common among the Jews. Now, we don't know anything else about her. 
but Paul must have known her or known about her, run across her somewhere, and knew she was back in Rome. But she does get the compliment of being a hard worker. In other words, she's serious about church. She's serious about service, about using her spiritual gift, about support. She is into it. All right? That's an important part of being a Christian, to be very supportive of your group. We learn more of greeting, more people to, to learn about in verse 7. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners, who are outstanding among the apostles, who were also in Christ before me. Well, we learned several things about these two. First of all, Andronicus was a Greek name, a common Greek name. Junia is probably his wife. All right? This could be another husband and wife pair, if that's the case. The reason I say that, if that's the case, because Junia, uh, if you change just the place of what they call an accent, this could have been a man's name by the name of Junius, which means that these two may have worked together, so it would be both be men. But I take it as Junia being a, a woman, as many scholars do. Paul tells us that they were my kinsmen, which indicates they were also Jews. So that would make them Hellenistic Jews, Greek Jews. Okay, uh, He says they were fellow prisoners. Now we don't know what this refers to. But it looks like they were also in prison, maybe with Paul, before or after, but probably for the faith they had been in prison. And he says, who are outstanding among the apostles. This doesn't necessarily say they are apostles, no. But it's probably saying that they had a good reputation among the apostles. I mean, the apostles knew about them. They had also probably contacted other apostles, perhaps Peter. Perhaps they had traveled to Jerusalem and run into people like uh, uh, maybe uh, some of the other well-known apostles that we really don't see much more of uh, after the, the beginning of the book of Acts. But I was thinking of people like James, but he was really, uh, he was the church leader in Jerusalem. But anyway, it also could mean that they were also missionaries and then Paul would be using the term like that and say they were outstanding missionaries but either way they were worth greeting and outstanding workers Paul says they Paul says they were in Christ before me which means they had been saved before Paul so they're probably older than Paul or maybe about the same age and then we come to our next person, verse 8. Greet Amphilatus, my beloved in the Lord. Here again, again we see my beloved, indicating that Paul probably knew him personally. It's a Greek name again, and that's about all we know, as he's mentioned here. And you know, for some people, that's probably just enough. Uh, to hear Paul mention your name in a letter uh, would make you realize that Paul remembers you, or he knows of you, and you're looking forward to seeing him too. Maybe get reacquainted. Verse 9, we learn a couple of more. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and Stachus, my beloved, here we see some more commendations. Paul has something to say nice about everyone. Urbanus is called a fellow worker. He must have been a good servant also. Stachus, my beloved. I don't know anything else about him either or Urbanus. But we do know Urbanus was a fellow worker with Paul. Stachus was beloved, so Paul probably knew him personally. Verse 10, let's meet Apelles. Greet Apelles, 
the approved in Christ. Greet those who are of the household of Aristobulus. Well, again, Apelles. He's called the approved. Now, what does that mean? We're not sure, but we know that Paul uses this in a way that means someone has passed a big test. Maybe he had faced down the religious crowd or had stood for what is true before the authorities. At any rate, Paul calls him the approved in Christ. So that's a commendation. That's a good thing to say. And then he says, Greet those who are of the household of Aristobulus. Now what's different about this? Paul doesn't say greet Aristobulus, but the household. You see that? This means that either Aristobulus is not a believer or he's already died. Now, the household would be those who served in his, uh, as in his, on his property, let's put it that way, or worked for him. We might say they were slaves on his estate. So, if Aristobulus has died or is, or is an unbeliever, there are those who work for him, or when he was alive they worked for him, who are Christians. And who knows, this may even be a house church. So they could be meeting in his house or meeting together as a group somewhere. We don't have any details on that. Verse 11. We have another unusual one. Greet Herodian, my kinsman. Greet those of the household of Narcissus who are in the Lord. Now, Herodian is not really a name. It's maybe a nickname for someone. But Herod, of course, he's well known in the Bible. Uh, uh, there was King Herod. And it appears that they at either one time supported Herod or they worked for him. And he's called Herodian. Okay? Uh, if you don't know someone's name, or someone has picked up a name for what they've done in the past, you know, like he used to be in the army, so they call him army, or he used to be a soldier, so they call him soldier, something like that. Uh, so, apparently he worked for Herod or supported him at one time. So Paul is identifying him by his past work or association. Notice he calls him my kinsman, again, a fellow Jew fellow countrymen, as Paul would say. Then he also adds, greet those of the household of Narcissus who are in the Lord. Now Narcissus is someone we know a little bit, bit from in history. It's the name of a well-known assistant to Emperor Claudius. Remember we talked about Claudius at the beginning? He's the one who ran the Jews and to Christians out of Rome and then he died and then they got to come back but Narcissus had killed himself and this happened not long before Paul wrote this letter to the Romans so again he's dead and the household slaves still alive are being greeted by Paul and you notice this was a common thing that Christians often worked for unbelievers. Not unusual. Not much different today. It's often the unbelievers who run the businesses. Not always, of course. But it's the unbeliever who lives for their business and gets business started. And, and basically, you hope they pay fair wages and treat you right. But if they don't, and that's where the Lord has you, it's going to be a constant test. So Paul greets some of the servants in this man's household who are in the Roman church. So apparently his heir, Narcissus's family member or heir, took over the household 
and the servants continue to serve there. I mean, after all, you just didn't drop your job and go off and get another one at the unemployment agency. You went where you could to live, to take care of yourself, sometimes to survive. In verse 12, we come and meet, it looks like, a couple of sisters. Greet Tryphena and Tryphosa, workers in the Lord. Greet Persis, the beloved, who has worked hard in the Lord. Now, Tryphena and Tryphosa sounds like sisters. I believe that's probably the case. Maybe even twins. And they're called workers in the Lord. So Paul knows about them too. And he says, say hello to them. Persis, another woman, that's a woman's name, probably single, who also worked hard in the Lord. Also called Beloved. So Paul probably knew her personally. Again, had run across her, and maybe learned about more about her from other people, but he wants to send along greetings to her also. And then one of my favorites. Verse 13. Greet Rufus. Boy, that sounds like a good country name. Rufus, chosen in the Lord. Also, his mother and mine. Now, what's this all about? Well, Rufus was actually quite famous. Not because of what he did, but because of what his father did. And for that, we're going to make a short trip over to the book of Mark. Let's look at Mark 15, 21. Now, let me give you the background. Jesus is on his way to the cross. He's walking to the cross, carrying his cross. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him, that would be the Roman soldiers, forced him to carry the cross. So Rufus's father, his name was Simon, and he's the one who carried the cross for Christ. Christ was too weak to carry it on, so the soldiers grabbed Simon. Well, one of his sons was Rufus, and I suppose Mark put the name Rufus in there because they become part of the church later on. So there's a very good chance, and many scholars believe this, there's no reason to, I think, seriously doubt it, that this is the Rufus whose father helped carry the cross for Jesus. Notice, it also says in our verse that Rufus was chosen in the Lord. Now, it's the first time we see this. Now, we're all chosen. We're all elected. But I think Paul has a different meaning here. He points this out to us that he was the one that was related to Simon. So basically, Rufus. People say, oh, you mean the Rufus? Said, yeah, the one that's chosen in the Lord, the one that's saved. That Rufus. So this would be the Rufus that was related to Simon. So Paul probably used the term to indicate that this is the one Mark mentioned. So he was a little bit famous, you might say. Then Paul also says, notice, also his mother. So Paul must have known his mother. And notice he says, and mine. Now this wasn't really Paul's mother, not the one that gave birth to him, but she had treated him like she was his mother. Very caring, probably very endearing, helping him as a young man, perhaps uh, take care of some uh, issues, especially when it came to have to deal with some of the people that he didn't know or perhaps he needed some things and she could help or maybe give some advice about certain things in her area. But anyway, she had helped Paul. And when Paul calls her mine, that's quite a, that's quite a commendation. 
She was so endearing to Paul that Paul called her mine. So she had helped Paul in some way, and he would be looking forward to seeing her. Verse 14. Greet Asyncritus, Philegion, Hermas, Petrobus, Hermas, and the brethren with them. The brethren with them probably first the same house church. This is one of those maybes where we get the number maybe four or five house churches. Now we don't know anything about these people except they're believers. But Paul mentions them. He knows about them. Perhaps when he talked to Priscilla and Aquila, they brought up their names. Well, these guys run this business, or they're a bunch of fishermen, or this or that, you see. And Paul knew about them as he would learn their names. And doesn't say he knew them personally, but he does want to greet them. He's greeting a whole lot of people, remember? Verse 15, we have some more. I told you there was a lot. Greet Philogus and Julia, Nereus, and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints who are with them. Now, Philogus and Julia, probably another couple. Nereus, that would be, it says Nereus and his sister. This may be their children. All right? So it would be Philogus, Philogus, and Julia's children, Nerus and his sister. Maybe Paul didn't know her name, but did know he had a sister. At least that's mentioning her uh, being there, even though Paul may not have known her name. Olympus. Probably this person's named because this is where they had another house church. When Paul says, and all the saints who are with them. This sounds like Paul's addressing another house church. So it mentioned the people who had houses and had church meet in their house. Now, that's the list for now. Paul will pick up some more. But now let's listen to a command Paul gives to these people. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. Well, when's the last time you experienced a holy kiss? Well, let's talk about that. First of all, it wasn't unusual. It was very common that believers would give a, a slight kiss to the other believer. Not on the lips, but on the cheeks, or perhaps on the forehead. Sort of like we give hugs today. Uh, Paul mentions this holy kiss in both his Corinthian letters, First and Second Corinthians, and First Thessalonians. Peter mentions it in First Peter. And the kiss was a common form of greeting in the ancient world, especially among Jews. Now, we may shake hands, uh, at least down here where we live, and then if you know someone better than that, sometimes you hug them or hadn't seen them for a while. But we usually don't kiss each other unless we're relatives, like a grandmother might kiss her grandkids and, you know, things like that. But this was a action of course, that shared affection and love among other believers. Then Paul writes, All the churches of Christ greet you. So Paul is basically relaying the message from all the churches, Gentile churches, that they also want to say hello. This is a way of connecting the circle of churches that Paul had been involved in. So this appears to be one of Paul's ways to bring these churches uh, 
into contact with one another. And I expect when Paul gets to Rome, he's going to tell them about all these churches and all these people and their conversations, perhaps over their dinners and so on. Well, we have some lessons to learn from the greetings. And I want us to look at them and give some thought to them because they are important. Let's look at the first four lessons. First of all, as Christians, no matter where we are, where we are in the world, if we're out on a ship, if we're out in the field, if we're out in some small town or large city, number one, we are not alone, either in ministry or service. We serve the same Lord. And he has given us all his spirit so that we can serve and to live the Christian life. Don't ever think you're alone as a Christian. Don't get what I call that Elijah complex where he says, me and the, I'm the only one, Lord. The Lord comes back and says, no, there's, there's 7,000 more. Okay. So you remember, there's always other believers around. Some of them going through difficult times like you maybe a whole lot worse so you pray for those unknown believers you make that connection you might read about them in a magazine or or hear about them in a letter or in your church gathering that we are all in ministry and service together two neither should we act alone by that i mean none of us are well we have an expression lone rangers one of my favorite little cowboy heroes and when I was a kid, but we depend on other believers. There's a back and forth in praying and sharing and serving, encouraging, and interaction. By that I mean there's talking, there's letters, there's emails and so on at many levels with different believers, older believers, younger believers, uh, believers about our age, maybe more mature, and so on. So we keep in contact with other believers. That's important for a lot of reasons. Many of them have come out in this Roman uh, letter. Three. Paul contacts these Roman Christians to tell him about his planned future visit to Rome. All right, I didn't fill that sentence out completely, but he contacts them so he knows he's trying so they know he's trying to get to them not only letting them know that he's coming but mention so many by name so Paul tells or contacts the Roman Christians about his future plans to visit Rome four there are a number of women mentioned did you mention that did you notice that Five are specified as workers in the Lord, telling us that women had a significant role in the churches. At least one of the women were married, probably two or three, another single, another a mother. Point five, if it's like today, it's often the women who set up and provide for those in house churches or other major supporting roles like caring for the needy or teaching the children. You know, we all have a place in ministry. Point six, though there are limitations on women's roles, 1 Timothy 2, 8 through 15, there are limits. Women can't do everything in a church. God doesn't gift them that way. They nevertheless have important roles and places to contribute to Christ's church. It doesn't mean they're any less important. It's just that they have different roles. Men and women have different roles in life, obviously. Fathers are fathers. Mothers are mothers, right? And God created them different. They have different roles. Well, they also have different roles assigned in the church. There are th some things that are better for women who are gifted that way. 
God gifts them to use their spiritual gifts. Same way with men. Seven, finally, the obvious lesson, the clear lesson we learn that we should greet people, stay in contact with fellow believers for many reasons. I know that's hard to do. We get so busy and we don't have really anything that important to say but we should stay in contact because even if you don't have much to say, and I'll tell you this from my end, I love to hear from you. I love a letter now and then just saying we're doing fine, we're enjoying our holiday season, or uh, my work is being overburdening right now, and I could use your prayer. Uh, please do that. Um, I constantly need your prayer. I'll just tell you that right now. I hope you pray for me every day. If you want to, you can pray half a dozen times a day. Because I know I can sure uh, use it. Uh, I need your support, and I know you need mine. Whether you realize it or not, I'm going to pray for you. All right? If I know you. So that's another good reason to contact me. So I can put you on my prayer list, and I can pray for you. And tell me sometimes, if, if you want, if you have some sort of special need. I have sent out prayer needs to some of you, and some of you had responded wonderfully, and I appreciate that. Remember this. Believers serve around the world. Some of them are in very isolated areas. Some of them are just trying to survive. We know of many in Africa and the Middle East who are being persecuted. There are believers in small towns and farm cities around the world, missionaries in remote areas, sometimes dangerous areas, and they are in constant need of encouragement and prayer. Send them a letter now and then. Contact them. Ask them what they can pray for specifically. And I think one of the lessons we learned here as a final point seven is that we should stay in touch with one another. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for this lesson, one of the last lessons we've learned in Romans. Lord, help us understand that we need to stay in contact with other believers, that we need to pray and encourage them. We need to support when needed. Help us be open to new believers to believers who are just getting into the faith. Help us be understanding of perhaps older believers, if that needs to happen. And help us be bold in our witness to those who are our age, uh, young believers, younger believers, and even older believers. Thank you for your power and your strength in the Spirit. Challenge us with what we've heard today. In Jesus' name, amen.